Hello, I'm Paul Wessel, University of Hawaii, but currently in Oslo, Norway. First of all, I want to thank the nominator, the committee, and AGU for awarding me this year's Lepto Lecture. It's a great honor, and I accept it on behalf of the entire GMT team. Hi, right, so my title is called The Genetic Mapping Tools and Animation for the Masses, which is a little bit provocative, I hope. Uh, because this is not a single person talk or a project. I had lots of help over the years, uh, initially with Walter Smith when we were both students at Lamont. But since then, Joachim, Leo, Remco, Florian, Walter, of course, Dong Dong, Max, and Federico have been instrumental in moving GMT forward. But I don't want to forget thousands of GMT users who have made contributions, big and small, from software patches to whole modules to just nuggets of ideas, bug reports, example scripts, fixing typos. There's just nothing specific that stands out there is everything, right? So what is GMT? Well, if you're watching this talk and have no idea what GMT is, then there will be things here that won't be explained well, because I kind of assume you kind of know. Um, so GMT is a tool set and library of about 150 different methods for data manipulations or high quality visualization. We know GMT is used by tens of thousands of scientists over the year, especially in global seismology, geodesy, geodynamics, and marine geophysics. But this is not an exhaustive list, planetology, oceanography, volcanology, and this, I see in GMT plots in almost any field of science. We initiated this, as I mentioned, back in 19, uh, 88, uh, Walter Smith and I, and it's since been supported by the NSF since 1993. Thank you, NSF. Uh, most users of GMT are familiar with the command line where you type in commands, but more recently there are options such as using GMT from MATLAB, Python, and Julia, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. For more information about early GMT and why GMT, uh, there are podcasts available on our uh, YouTube channel. All right, uh, exchange of scientific knowledge has been important to all of us. Uh, and we know that this insights can be shared much quicker if the software that people use are freely available and runs on any platform, that data is freely available and well documented in non proprietary formats, and that publications contain everything one needs to reproduce and extend results. So GMT was designed uh, with these goals in mind. So we, we think we made a lot of effort and progress on the first couple. The third one is sort of partly outside our hands, uh, but we wish to uh, enable that as well. One important event happened in 2013 where we released the uh, first GMT API. So the API was basically a library uh, made from the 150 or so individual programs that constituted GMT4. Uh, it's a lot of rewriting to make those functions into a library. Decisions were made and uh, now we have this API uh, and we have a single program called GMT that accesses all the modules, uh, which are these former 150 programs in the library. Uh, and you will write shell scripts and call GMT with the module name and the options. Uh, and that's how things are done. Uh, but by having this API, you can now imagine sitting in other environments, such as Python or Julia notebooks or MATLAB for that matter, and write and call and pass information in and out of GMT uh, through a little layer, we call it the API between the C uh, GMT API and, uh, and the user environments. And of course, this simplifies uh, things uh, dramatically. We also added uh, options for making new custom core and supplemental modules to the API. And because external programs can use the API just like any other C library. So both the MB system and GMT SAR are using the GMT library for various tasks, such as reading and writing grids specifically, but a few other things as well. And we all stand on top of the shoulders of giants, uh, all the open source that's been written before and continue to be developed that we all benefit from. Now, from the very beginning, 
GMT was hard to learn. And we want to simplify it. Uh, but the problem is that there's thousands of GMT scripts and workflows that needs to run before. Uh, so we can't make dramatic changes and break all these scripts. We have simplified and standardized options across GMT and added more examples. But uh, the biggest hurdles is uh, stuff that we can't address with such small changes. And we, we are yelled at, make it simpler, but don't change anything. That's the tall order. So what are these major GMT hurdles? we talk about here. Well, GMT basically was written by techies and we ask just too much tech know-how know -how, <laughs> know uh, from new users. Uh, for instance, the user is responsible for assembling a valid PostScript document from any number of overlays uh, by carefully using the minus O and minus K options. If you mess that up, it's boom, it won't work. PostScript is a language, so how we put it together matters greatly. Imagine dropping a stack of punch cards in the old day on the floor and putting them up in a random order. That stack would not run well on the punch card reader. We also make the user responsible for handling the redirection of PostScript from the standard outputs to stream. First, you create a file and append to it. If you mess that up, boom. You're also responsible for passing region and projection information on every command, even if it doesn't change. And it's very easy to make a slight mistake there and either you get a wrong plot or it just doesn't work. So in my GMT class that I teach, we call these the rookie errors one, two, and three. There's many further, but that's a good start. So during a GMT summit in 2016 at the Scripps, we thought about this problem and we came up with the only solution. And that was to introduce the run modes introduced classic versus modern run modes. So in 6, we introduced modern mode, which is then this new mode that complements the existing and only classic run mode. Uh, classic remains GMT's default behavior. So that means existing scripts, GMT4 scripts in particular, shall run in classic mode and will thus be backwards compatible with the previous versions, which is what we need. Now, modern mode, though, allows us to address the major obstacles to GMT mastery and to ensure that GMT can be competitive with other tools and be more modern. That's the main benefit here. And, uh, for instance, modern mode is the only mode available in GMT Python package. The Julia package is a little bit mixed, but it's mostly you'll see it's modern. So, basically, we made things simpler without changing anything. That's how we did it. So what is this modern mode? Well, we extended GMT with seven new commands. Uh, there is the sequence that starts with begin and end, which sort of encapsulates a modern mode session. Those commands did not exist in classic mode, so there's no way you can get into modern mode with a classic script. You don't have those commands. So inside a, a modern mode session, you can create any number of figures, it's give them names and decide, decide what kind of format you want PDF or JPEG or more than one format. There's an inset command that adds a map inset to a plot, makes that simple. And there's a subplot command that helps with setting up multi-panel plots. And then there's a, some bookkeeping things and a useful tool called GMT Docs, which will display the, the module documentation right in the browser from the command line. Uh, all these sessions are run in isolation mode, so uh, you can run many at the same time. They don't interact. So there's many benefits of this modern mode. Here are some of the simplifications that we have achieved. Uh, this whole idea of post reproduction, which still happens, is completely hidden from the user. So that means that there's no way to make a stacking order error with the minus O minus K option because those options are not available anymore. There is no way to make an issue or an error due to redirection because you are not in charge of that anymore. We do. And uh, because the modern mode remembers more about the session, we can keep track of things like the current projection region for you. We can also assist with you know, layout options because we know the size of plots. And we also know what the current color table that you might have used is. So we don't have to ask you for that again. So, with these uh, changes, uh, modern mode eliminates the most severe GMT errors, making it much simpler. 
just to give you a sense of what this looks like, here are two scripts that make the same plot. One is classic Mo GMT4 and the other one is GMT6 on the right here. Uh, the key thing here is you know, it's just less alphabet soup, less letters and random options. There's no redirections, it's always tricky and may cause trouble on different operating systems. There's no explicit, uh, explicit conversion from PostScript to other formats. Uh, you just specify initially what you want and the default is PDF. And then optionally, you can use the show keyword on GMT end and the plot will pop up on the screen on any platform. We also added a bunch of enhancements to, to find global grids, such as DEMs, crustal age, geopotential fields, some imagery, etc. These can be accessed with a special symbol, that symbol, and uh, you will find these files uh, on the net and copy them over to your computer. You don't have to install anything, it just works. Uh, you need an internet connection though. Um, this also is done in tutorial and documentation so that you can copy and paste code snippets from the browse documentation to your terminal and it will run because it will get those files the same way. We also simplified placement of map embellishments, KML output, and uh, yeah, basically GMT modern mode really complicates classic mode and simplifies GMT use. You can still use classic mode for certain things, uh, but modern mode is the way to go. Uh, here are some of the automatic global data sets, you know, with Earth dates, uh, Earth ages from this, the Earth Byte group, free year, vertical gravity gradient, and so on from Sandwall, uh, topography from a variety of sources, uh, NASA imagery, magnetic field, and so on. And these are at the high resolution, but also down sampled to low resolutions using uh, spherical filtering. So that when you need a resolution for a particular purpose, you can get that. Making a plot, you can have GMT decide what is the resolution that is sensible for the plot you're making and the data. Uh, these data sets uh, live on GMT servers around the planet. Uh, massive servers sitting in Hawaii, but we have uh, replicas around the world. Uh, if you want to shorten the time it takes to download files and tiles, uh, you can help set up a server near you. I mentioned that command line interface is what most GMT users grew up on, but those days are changing. We'll say that most new users now uh, find themselves playing with PyGMT or GMT Julia or GMT Max, because if those are the key environments that they do most of the programming and modeling in, it's just natural to continue there and, and make the plots there. And since GMT, I will argue, makes superior plots compared to some of the other packages, uh, there's a demand for making GMT plots from Python, from Julia, from MATLAB. And we have released three wrappers in various uh, stages of completeness. Um, and the syntax in those wrappers very little bit, but pretty much we are aiming for modern keyword arguments, kind of dictionary type settings to make it easier to read and write scripts. The rest of the talk here is going to focus a little bit more on animation and its use in science, and specifically in our science, obviously. So I think we can agree that many quests of science involve understanding change over time. It's critical. Uh, just limiting my examples to plate tectonics, which I'm most familiar with, uh, think back at the heydays of plate tectonic revolution when Tunzo Wilson proposed transform faults. It was just a brand new concept that was counterintuitive. And uh, I've been told, that I was not around at the time, that Tunzo made flipbooks to show the evolution of these transform faults and show it at the people at the HU meetings. Because what can he do? There's just no other way. Uh, Ten years later or so, uh, Richard Hay came up with the idea of propagating rifts. That was even more geometrically challenging to try to convey. And it, it took a long time for him to get acceptance of that idea. And it didn't really happen until he was able to make a computer animation that showed the evolution of a rift with a propagating rift on it. Then people said, oh yeah, that's how it works. Of course, simple. Uh, but you know, it's, it's tricky. 
And that's back in the 70s and 80s. I mean, hopefully we've come a long way since then, I hope. So the basic requirements for you know, communicating uh, animations to, uh, uh, in science is, you know, first you have to have the ability to generate these animations. Okay, well, people have always had that. Especially if you have a generous budget, you just pay someone who specializes in making animations. It's not a problem. Uh, but if it's up to you to do it, then you're looking at what tools can you afford, what tools do you have, what can they do. And then there's the ability to publish them. I mean, if you have to spend all this time to make a slick animation and then there's no way to publish it anywhere, what do you do? I mean, pre-internet, you know, how did you publish things? I mean, Richard Hayes propagating Rift, you know, was in a VHS tape that insiders had. Uh, but even now, why can't we publish these things? Well, you can, I know, but not the way I think it should be done. Back in the early 2000s, AGU decided to allow dynamic content in the journals. That was very exciting, and that was on the AGU's Information Technology Committee at the time. We discussed this quite a bit. But 20 years later, that still seemed to mean Oh, well, just place the, a zip file or a folder with a movie in a supplemental archive. It's, it's not, let's click on figure three or movie three in the, in the HTML article. No, you have to dig through the supplemental archive. So only specially interested people will do this. I asked AG, how many journals allow dynamic content? And the answer was two, advances and community science. There you can actually get dynamic content into the publication, but only if you can follow specific instructions on how to submit embedded material. So that means the threshold is still pretty high to do this. So I have to conclude that as of 2022, we're still stuck in paper publication mode. It may not be physical paper, but it's digital paper PDF. Uh, I don't understand why we can't allow movies uh, in archives anymore. All right, cheap to modules for animation. So it's been bothering me for a while. It's, it's so difficult to make animation. I have tried to make GMT animation back in the day, and it's a lot of scripting to make things happen. Some things are relatively simple, but stuff with things that should be on the screen only for some frames is very hard to program. So on my flight back from an AG meeting some five years ago, I decided to write the movie module. And the principle here is that it hides the loop over the frames and other bookkeeping tasks and the conversions of you know, PostScript Plus to frames and assembling a movie. All that stuff is out of sight. Then we have the events module, which is needed to plot symbols that should just be up on the frame or some frames for some time and then go away or maybe fade away or some other way to, to dissipate. And that's not easy to do by hand but the events module let you do this. And then we have the third problem where you have uh, data sets of grids, for instance, or different depths for that matter, and you want to make a movie of it, and you want to keep the time between the frames the same, but it should represent the same time, then you may have to interpolate additional layers in the 3D stack to make that happen. So that's to interpolate. Now the basic gene animation layout uh, it's an optional title sequence with optional fading in and out. So you can have, you know, Smith et al, so-and-so, title, what is this, movie four, something like that. Uh, up front, if you want to, you can always add that in the movie software, but it's easy to do it uh, scripting. And then we have the main animation sequence, which is the main movie. And it can have a fade in, fade out, of course. And there's three, well, there's three key elements, that two of them are optional. You, you may have a background script that makes a background plot. Let's say you want the you know, coastline plot in the background and stuff happening in the front. You will plot that once with the script because it doesn't change in the movie. And same thing, if you have something on top that you want to overlay, like boundaries or titles or whatever, that doesn't change, that's a separate script that just plots that one thing and it puts it on top. Now everything else, things that change, that is the main script uh, which is a GMT script that looks like any other, other one, except that some of the parameters and arguments in the script will have special names and refer to basically variables, uh, and then we'll get the data from some data table. Uh, the timed events, how do you animate them? 
Well, okay, so we thought about this a little bit. And basically events uh, are typically symbols that should only be visible for some frames in a movie. So here, for instance, I'm uh, looking at the symbol size. And the way you can think of this is that before the event happens, the symbol size is zero, green line there on the left. And then the symbol, the event happens, and the symbol jumps to size one. This is just a you know, scaling factor of what the actual symbol size might be. And then it stays at one until the end of the event, and then jumps back to zero. So we'll take each of these curves that goes with different time symbols and different times and use that to scale the symbol, basically. Now we have a way of plotting the same symbol again and again and again, but a different size. Because when it's zero, we don't plot it. We can also do this with transparency and color intensity. But furthermore, we could also simply adjust that simple step function and make it more interesting. You can have a little rise time, it can go up a little higher to announce the arrival of the event before it decays back to normal size. And then when it ends, it may, instead of disappear, it may just fade back to some fixed uh, smaller size perhaps, or perhaps uh, same size, but maybe the, the, the transparency changes or the color intensity changes. So you can play with these three different curves per symbol by tuning these parameters. Again, for the grid stack interpolation, we simply want to get intermediate uh, grids in the time sequence so that we have a constant equidistant spacing between grids. And that's what GRD interpolate does. Uh, okay, let's look at some movies here. So, Seismicity during 2018. That was an active year for us. We had the big Kilauea eruption in the East Rift Zone. Uh, this movie is going to just pan through the Pacific from 140 East to 240 East. Uh, uh, from January to December 2018, one frame per day, so 365 frames. We're going to use events then for each position to highlight new, uh, new quakes by changing the size, color, intensity when they first happen, and then we're going to decay back to darker colors after a few days. So this script has two lines of code, the main script. Plot the background, plot the events. Let's see what it looks like. So you can see here the, the quakes happen, they sort of blow in your face. Here we are, here we are, and then they sink back to a, a smaller symbol, and then they go dark, red, green, and blue. The colors reflect the epicenter depth, of course. And that's it. So we had a lot of quakes there in Hawaii around July, August, and I'll see more of that later. But uh, there's only two lines of code here. It's the main script, quakes.cshell, a uh, shell, sorry. It's just a GRD image call with appropriate data and an events call that plots the quakes. And because they both have a bunch of options, and like all GMT options, you have to study the map page to figure out what's going on there. But you'll see some special variables, movie column one, movie column zero. This is information that is pulled from a table. And that's how the magic happens. We pull from a table, replace those variables with actual values, and then call all the scripts again and again with different values in parallel. And then we assemble the movie. The movie command itself on the bottom here just takes the Quake script as an argument and a bunch of other things that sets up size and names and should there be a label, it's a kind of format. And uh, that will do all the, the running. Okay, another movie is the East Pacific Rice Flyover. So this is just a snippet of a long flight where we fly over the entire mid-ocean ridge system at 1,000 km elevation, 24 frames a second. We just take a, a bit of a ridge location path and smooth it, and then we say that's the path. So we just fly there and we bank the spaceship as we have a change in azimuth, and every frame here is just a single call to GRD image. And the dem data we use is a 30 arc second SRTM 30 plus. So here you basically see we're flying up across the mid -ocean, or top of the mid-ocean ridge system, we're getting up to the Galapagos triple junction here. Uh, above it, we have the Cocos plate. We're coming up on the Sequarius and Clipperton fracture zone system. We see the Middle America Trench on the right there, and the Gulf of Mexico in the distance. We're getting up to the end, uh, the Rivera fracture zones, the little Rivera plate, uh, and then the spreading center moves into the Gulf of California, the North America plate on the right. On the left here we have the Pacific, and we start to see the very long 
specific fracture zones that Menard characterized early on. First one's going to be the Murray fracture zone. And then further up at the end of California here for Mendocino, we get, of course, the long Mendocino fracture zone. And that's where the plate boundary get, exits the land, it goes into the ocean again. We follow the Juan de Fuca uh, ridge, with all these sea mounts up in the like, Gulf of Alaska here. And then the movie stops when we get subducted. So, again, it's a very simple movie, a single call to GRD image. It's just been you know, weaponized by the movie command. Uh, now for something more science-y. So we're going to look at uh, deformation at Kilauea volcano during the eruption sequence in 2018, as seen by INSAR. So here we have ascending and descending satellites with length of sight, line of sight uh, that have different repeat times. So the time between the satellite passes may change. So it's difficult to make a movie that honors the time per frame in that case. Uh, the solution, of course, is to interpolate the 3D stack of grids at equidistant time points. And that's what you're going to interpolate. Does. Um, so this um, animation was created with data produced by Jeep Sar and done by Lauren Ward and Bridget Smith Conter at my university. So we start off with, you know, here's the background. The first slide is just two plots of the big island, one with ascending and ascending uh, deformation in the line of sight. There's nothing to see there because there's nothing going on. Uh, the, the circles are historical earthquakes up to that point, uh, end of February. As we start playing the movie, we'll get future quakes. Obviously, they're going to come on just like in a similar manner to before. They're going to pop up a little bit. And there's no deformation going on because there's just background quakes. But as we get towards the end of April, around May 1st, suddenly we get the whole bunch of activity with the eruptions of Kilauea, the cessation of Puuo, and the inflation of the rift zone. And you see a lot of deformation on the big island in both images here and earthquakes going off like crazy on Kilauea until the end of uh, July, early August, and then it just stops and nothing happens. Seismic waveforms. I'm, I'm showing this here to illustrate how do you do lines, because lines don't have properties like variable thickness and variable color normally. They are lines. Most languages, uh, graphic language, will just draw a line. So GPT turns lines, if you want to, into dense point clouds. And then now you have point circles. They can be animated and colored and drawn differently in time. So we can highlight the leading edge of a time series that evolves. So this was done by Don Don. And it's a very simple movie, just showing the three components of uh, the recording station uh, on Dulgoy Island from a quake in the Aleutians. And uh, we're seeing the three components here. It's a little hard to see here, but the leading edge of the colored pen is slightly lighter and thicker, but it drops back very quickly. We may want to make that even more obvious by using a black pen and having it, uh, you know, get a burning paper sense with the hot color table at the leading edge. I think we'll try that next. But basically, it's a way to animate lines through time. One thing that's maybe, maybe not, but pretty unique to GPT, I think, and that's our ability to animate focal mechanisms. So in a recent version of GMT, we had the ability to animate certain seismological and geodetic symbols. Here we're going to do CMT beach pulse. You can also use geodesy and velocity vectors. So here we project 40 years of seismicity onto a profile showing Benio zone beneath South America. This was created by Federico. And what you see here is the background map. We're going to look at the seismicity. There's an inset here showing where we are. The red line is the profile. We're going to project all the beach balls onto that line and see the cross section beneath as time goes forward. The um, color bar there shows the focal depth. And next to it is the time slider that's automatically built by movie. You just select, I want that kind of slide, and it will put it there. And then we'll slide through time. And as time goes forward, Quakes happen and they just pop up and they happen and then they are plotted both on the map and in a cross section. And we're running out of time here about 2021. So pretty straightforward, it's just a bunch of symbols, but here the symbols are a little more complicated and they take a focal mechanism to draw. 
All right, so we have the ability to make all kinds of science animations, uh, but we can't publish it, apparently. So I would say, well, what are you going to do? You've got a stamp of fight here. You have to go to the barricades. It's obvious to me, at least, that animations and movies are much better at communicating specific elements of a scientific argument or a scientific idea or an hypothesis. So if if AGU scientists agree with me, I hope they do, then we need to explain this to the bureaucrats and the demand that this is a requirement and that PDF print is not an acceptable long-term uh, archive format because it, it won't let you, well, I shouldn't say this, you can have movies in PDF, but we don't have it, AGU doesn't have it. So maybe it's not the best suitable format. That's a technical argument that can be sorted out, but the fact that we can't put movies in anywhere is the big problem. And if we don't assign AG science push for this thing, then it probably won't happen. And we'll be one of the last ones to experience the benefits of the digital revolution. Uh, and maybe we'll be shot in the barricades, so it's not sad, anything like that. All right, to conclude here, I'll say that GPT is ancient by computing standards, 34 years, but it's stronger than ever, more users and developers and platforms. A modern mode is a greatly simplified learning GMT, teaching GMT, scripting, and documentation. The three modules, movie, events, and GRD interpolate, promise animations for the masses. I truly believe that, but again, the, the hurdles have to come down. Scientific communities like ours and publishers like ours, here at AGU and Wiley, really need to take the lead in enabling truly dynamic content in publications. There's no excuse for not being able to click on figure four in HTML and the argument, well, we can't because you can't do that in the PDF. It's like, well, move on. I'm watching these things on a, an iPad or phone or something. I can click on things. I don't understand. All right, GMT is at 6.4 right now. We're working on 6.5. You can see more details at our webpage. Um, I'll end with a plea. Uh, please join the GMT community. If you are a GMT user, uh, it will take a village to maintain this thing going forward. Um, I've been doing this for 35 years, but you know, I'm not going to do the next 35 years. So if we want you to survive a little bit longer and morph into something even more useful, like we're seeing with Python and Julia, we need help. We need scientists that are willing to pitch in as their skill sets and time allows. It's not all about coding. There's a whole lot of loose ends that needs to be dealt with, with documentation to websites, examples, testing, workshops. You know, it needs people who can take charge and make a small or large contribution as the time allows. If you do want to code, it doesn't have to be C, which is what the main gene of the core is written in. We need people who can do things in MATLAB, Python, and Julia as well, and testing those wrappers and running workshops. And our contributor guide outlines you know, how do you get credit and how do you climb up in hierarchy. So please consider joining us in providing GMT to the rest of the world for the foreseeable future. Thank you very much for listening to my rants. The end.